in the interests of talking about films and that, we should talk about one of the films and that. That being in and of itself, which is Drew's uh, responsibility. Derek Delgado's In and of Itself is, in no way, a film. However, this recorded version of the stage show was directed by Frank Oz and IMDb listed it as a documentary, so I'll take it, as what I really wanted was an excuse to watch this and talk about it, as, apparently, everyone has been talking about it, or so I am led to believe. Premiering in Los Angeles and then moving to New York for a run of 552 performances, in and of itself is a magic show that, in large part, issues the use of magic, which is, to be sure, a bold choice. <laughs> Rather than using elaborate, showy set pieces, the soft-spoken Del Gaudio will favour subtler fare, often close-up and card tricks, to focus his audience's attention and to help tell the story that is the backbone of the show. That story is of Del Gaudio himself, a selective autobiography, as he ponders the question of, who am I? and asks the audience to consider the same thing, while curiously and frequently performing low-key tricks. As an aside, I rather worry about the audience members wowed by what is, clearly, kinetic sand, a children's <laughs> toy. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Is, sorry. As we watched it, I basically turned around to my wife and said, that's just kinetic sand. <laughs> it's very obvious. <laughs> Um, uh, <laughs> or indeed the later brick discovery oh my god how could a non-unique brick possibly get to somewhere else in New York City 30 minutes to an hour after its location <laughs> during a show it's a Merkle oh dear mind blown <laughs> most of the gasps and the emotion are left to the finale though an impressive feat of memorization, certainly, but the basic mechanics of which seem very easy to guess at, and the actual payoff seems astonishingly manipulative, mm. especially compared to the genuinely emotional letter sequence a little earlier in, the, earlier in the piece. I have seen this portion described as an emotionally devastating sucker punch, but to me the appropriate term is cheap shot. Mm. Near the beginning, in a voiceover recorded for the film, Del Gaudio tells us, you think this is a performance. You see a man in a theatre. There's an audience. His lines are memorised, his actions rehearsed. It is difficult to see past what this looks like. Hell, it's easy to lie on a stage. It's even easier to lie in a film. I do not expect you to believe anything you're seeing or hearing. And knowing you won't believe me, that's the only reason I'm going to tell you the truth. You do have a choice, though. You can see it for what it is, or you can imagine what it could be. Now, I wish that I could see it for what it could be, but I can only see it for what it is. Bullshit. <laughs> you, you cynical, soulless automaton. <laughs> this is a performance, and Del Gaudio a good actor. I, I certainly hope that's the case, because if his tears are actually genuine, then after 552 performances, he must surely be utterly destroyed and suffering from PTSD. I'm not buying it, especially as I know the story of El Rulatista that forms a significant part of the narrative is a 1993 short story by Romanian novelist Mircea Catavescu, not the Spanish urban legend it's presented as. Despite what I appreciate seems a very negative review, though, I still found this passably enjoyable, and it's certainly interesting, so it's probably worth seeing. Just don't believe the hype. Yeah, um, it's an interesting beast, this. I was... Um really intrigued to watch it uh, because of I think before I'd heard anyone else mentioning it I had listened to an interview with Del Gaudio and uh, Frank Oz on a podcast whose name escapes me I can't remember what it was and it was a fascinating interview and to listen to him talk about the intent for the stage uh, production and subsequently this documentary in inverted commas really just a screen translation of of the performance um i actually 
Uh, I feel like I feel like if the intent was there, that it's fascinating. I think what they were attempting to do, but I don't think necessarily um, this pulls it off. Certainly, it's potentially not necessarily a failing so much of the stage production as it is just the translation to film. I suspect that a great deal is lost emotionally uh, in the transition. Um, from you know the the potency, I suppose, of of being a member of the audience and surrounded and allowing yourself to be swept up in the performance of it all it, in the moment, um, I can imagine being much more connective in a way that I think they were aiming for with this uh, and some of the deeper themes of or well deeper themes. I don't think the themes are all that deep, really. Um, what Delgadio was hoping to achieve. It's just that to hear him talk about it was intrinsically more interesting than to see it executed here. And I think there's only so much you can do necessarily with a filmed performance, or I suppose this was multiple filmed performances spliced together for our benefit. There's always going to be intrinsically something that you lose, no matter how you know competently it's it's been done. And there are only so many techniques at a director's disposal to translate something like that to to the screen. But like you, Drew, I still found it an interesting artifact. There were points where I, it threatened to find me emotionally engaged, um, but it never really quite pulled that one particular trick off. And as you say, it's it's just... It, it does seem most suspicious or, or certainly bold, as you put it, at least that you would present yourself as, uh, as a magician and then uh, and attempt to entrance an audience for the better part of, you know, well, an hour plus um, by performing very little actual magic. Oh, yeah. And that, that, again, inverted commas magic, which is performed, as you quite rightly say, Drew, um, all very easy to guess the mechanics of. So, um, yeah, a really interesting experiment. I would say not necessarily a 100% failed experiment, but certainly less impactful than I certain uh, reviews and comments I've heard made about it would have uh, perhaps set my hopes up for. But yes, I I don't know. Scott, maybe you took something else away from it? I don't think I took anything else away from it. I, I probably enjoyed it more because of... Well, I guess recently I've been more in of the mind that if you're going into something that is you know, plainly a magic show, then mm. you just need to try and shut that part of your brain off and go along with it. Because yes. if you saw something, magic hasn't really transitioned to the age of YouTube and slow motion all that well. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, if you're going to look for the mystery of these kind of things, you can probably find it fairly easy. So you have to kind of make your peace with the, the meta answer that all magic is, you know, incredibly skilled performances, sleight of hand, gimmicked, decks and objects, all that kind of thing. So we, the answer is there. That's the, the meta answer for all of it. How, how to do that magic trick? The answer is, it's a trick. So you need to know that going into it and just be accepting and go along with it. And I think um, perhaps I was a little bit more engaged with uh, Derek Delgadio than you did. I was happy enough to be swept along by his throne. I think he's quite a captivating speaker. I mm. was happy enough to go along with it. Um, you're probably right, Craig, in as much as certainly the, that last trick would be much more impactful if you're there in a relatively small audience sort of cooped together having gone through all this together and it's maybe a little bit more cheese-tastic when you have the uh, distance of the camera and your living room and the slightly uncomfortable sofa you might be sitting on uh, in, in between that. So, yes, it is it is not, I guess, as effective as it would be where you're sitting in there in the auditorium. But uh, for the most part, I, I was actually quite on board with this. I quite liked it. I think he's quite a captivating speaker. It, it is worth watching. Um, I don't think were it separate, I would be paying to go and see it if this was the kind of um, mm. you know like Cineworld's film theatre performances that kind of thing I don't think I'd be spending the extra to go and see it were that the case but for something that is you know streaming on Netflix this was I think if I remember rightly Hulu um, Hulu um, yeah it's something that's readily available um, on your, your internet of choice it's worth a go if you have any interest in uh, magic at all um, to be honest you might get more fun from just going onto YouTube and looking for Penn and Teller Fuller's clips instead but you know it, it's pretty good I liked it so <laughs> Take of that watch. I did find them reasonably engaging. I just, I was, I wasn't, and I was very careful to make sure that I didn't go with this mindset of like wanting to hate it because everybody else said it was great and so many people were talking about it. I, I was very careful not to do that. It's just that when he starts adding things about how like all oh, this is true and things, and then it's, it just, it rolled me the, the wrong way when he's saying things like that. 
Um, I mean, that, that's fair enough. But I mean, the thing you have to remember is that any magic performance where they start saying things like, oh, this is true, the performance started immediately before they started saying that sentence. You know, it's the same thing when Darren Brown does his tricks. I'm saying, oh, like, I know, there's definitely no stooges in the audience here. No. It's like, okay. That, that was less I about see you, there. Dirk. But not about the tricks that, I mean, it's just like, yeah. it's the emotional impact of it. It's like, it was bothering me because it just, so much of it rang hollow. And that annoyed me because. I mean, you can't say like, like look at the people's faces when they did that um, multiple edit at the end of like the multiple audiences, mm. like that people were seemingly getting some sort of emotional impact from that. But it just, it just felt so hollow, manipulative to me, and it really bothered me. And it really undercut it for me. Like again, but it's interesting, and I do find him quite engaging. Mm-hmm. And why, like, if there's any kind of truth to his emotion at the end. Like, then I actually feel really sorry for him because he must be a wreck um, do you know to do what, that every night. Do you know what I found most upsetting about that end sequence is that there were certain members of the audience where he didn't actually reveal what they had chosen. He would just make a comment to them, like there's one yeah, guy... Like, keep I up think, the good work or something like that. Keep up the good work or something. And then the one person who you really wanted him to do that with, and it's a guy who has basically picked nobody... Yeah. And he sort of pauses on the guy. And what I really wanted Derek Delgado to say to that guy was, don't ever think that. Yeah. And then just move on to the next person. Mm. But instead he just says, a nobody. And the guy, visibly quite upset, just sits yeah. back down in his seat and he goes on. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I just kind of really wish he had addressed that different, <laughs> differently. <Yes. laughs> just from a humanistic standpoint. But I did I did overall find it and I wanted to be swept along with it. And um, I, I do find myself becoming quite emotional quite easily these days. So I'm perhaps surprised at myself that I, I came out of it quite, I don't know if cynically is the word, but I, I would tend to describe it the same way you did, Drew, which is to say that there's an element of emotional manipulation there mm. that I didn't necessarily appreciate, I think. But yeah. I don't know. Um, I, I'm quite sure, as I say, if, if you know, to have been an audience member at one of those performances may have been, um, you know, a completely different experience. I also just don't buy that the letter readers aren't just audience plants. Uh, no, no matter how much he protests in the interview that I listened to, that uh, they had a lot of mixed results with that, and that there were there were people who went up and read the letter and said nothing and just went and sat, sat back down. Um, again, we've only got Derek's word for that. See, uh, now that's a that's a bit like emotionally that did work for me, and um, like I didn't know about the exam. Like, I um, heard him speak anything about it at all. Mm. So I've done the research you have there, Craig. Um, I've got the background. But I mean, I can understand it. Maybe some things that wouldn't work. But I could see the levers of that. It's like, okay, mm. they, they have an audience list. They know who's coming. They do. They've got researchers. They can contact their family because like maybe booked out months in advance for the time to do it. The mechanics of it, I could guess that. But it seemed to me like those were... Well, like, I, I bought it anyway. Like Those were real letters written by people in that in the family and stuff rather than being plants um and if if that's true if I, i'm not just being fooled then that was genuine emotion mm. um it doesn't really work as an audience thing though um particularly no. if like that not everybody's crying but um, whereas that felt considerably less manipulative because that was like a real thing that meant something to that person i suppose at the end which is just i just felt so phony to me and it, it bothered me you know what my problem with that letter sequence is and the one thing that just convinces me that those people are plants is that all it takes is that member of the family to say it. So you know, out of 500 odd performances, someone's going to go home and have someone say to them, yeah, yeah, how did you find that man? One of his researchers phoned me six months ago and asked me to write this thing. And that's it ruined, you know? So I don't know. I just, I don't know. I, if I, I would... I kind of want to go back and listen to that interview again. I'll have to see if I can find it. Um, and I might listen to it again. If I can find out where it was, Drew, I'll, I'll let you know, because I don't know if I might might take something else away from it after listening to that again, recontextualise it a bit. But it's certainly really interesting. I wouldn't say to anybody, don't listen, uh, don't watch it. I think it's worth watching the once, if only to be part of the conversation and, and to make your own mind up about it. But I think you'll you, you'll very much take away from it uh, something different depending on the mindset you go in with like as you said Scott I think if you're willing just to shut everything off and, and go in and set aside your cynicism and enjoy it purely as a performance then yes sorry I've waffled enough <laughs> I tend to do that okay um, 